you see my presentation. Yes. Right. Thank you. Thank you for the nice uh, presentation. Uh, it's a, for me, it's a pleasure to be here and it's an honor, of course. So as Wolfgang say, today I will talk about meta-analysis of structural equation and models with the MetaSEM uh, package. Uh, so I will start first uh, with some background. So what is a mass and model? So a mass and model is composed of two things. Uh, it has the best of two words. On one side, we have the meta-analysis, which I don't know if I need to introduce this here, but I will like, briefly do it. It's a statistical technique used to combine the results of separate studies with the goal of drawing conclusions based on the combined information. In a meta-analysis, uh, we have an interest in the average effect and we have an interest on the differences between studies. On the other side, we have a structural equational models. So structural equational models are a confirmatory technique that can be used to fit hypothesized models to the data. So in a structural equational models or SEM, the model comes first and is, will be based on theory and your goal is to test where the model fits the data well. So an example of our SEM model is a pad model, which is used to specify relationships among observed variables. For example, a mediation model in which there is a direct and an indirect effect of X on Y. And a second example of a SEM model is a factor model. So in a factor model, the goal is to look at the relationship between a Latin variable and observed variables. The Latin variables, as you can see here, is represented with an ellipse, and the observed variables are represented with squares. So for example, the Latin variable in this model can be an indicator of intelligence and the observed variables can be scores in different areas of intelligence, such as mathematical intelligence, verbal intelligence, and so on. So in this particular model, we state that the scores of individual in the test or in this test cover it because there is a common factor intelligence that affects the scores in all six tests. So the nice thing about SEN models is that you don't need the raw data to fit them. So if you multivariate normality of the data holds, then the covariance matrix or the correlation matrix and the sample size are sufficient to fit uh, your SEN models. So this is one of the reasons that, or the reason that we can perform a meta-analysis of SEM. So here we have an observed covariance matrix and a theoretical model proposed based on theory. With SEM, we model the covariance matrix as a function of these uh, SEM parameters. And when you fit your SEM model to data, what happens is that the estimation algorithm will come up with parameters that will make the difference between your model implied covariance and the observed uh, uh, covariance as small as possible. So if the difference is very small, then we can say that the model fits the data well. Uh, and there are different fit indices that can be used to fit, uh, to assess the fit of your model. So as you can see, SEN models are a powerful technique uh, that can be used in several situations. When we combine meta-analysis and SEM, we can use all the relevant data instead of only one data set, that is the common practice in SEM research. And if there are several, for example, if there are several research reports investigating the direct effect of X on Y and X on M, but not of M on Y, uh, and other research reports investigating the effects of X on Y and X on M, but not of um, X on Y, then we can mix uh, the information from these different reports uh, to combine or to compute an overall estimate of the full, of the full model. With SEM uh, or with meta-analysis of SEMs, we can also investigate the differences between studies by using moderator analysis to determine whether the variance in the, in this, in this case, uh, regression coefficients uh, of the SEM parameters are related to study design variables. So maybe there are different samples or different age uh, or education in the samples, so to say. On the other side, the use of SEM meta-analysis allows you to evaluate complete hypothesized models instead of one single effect sizes. 
So for example, in the standard meta-analysis, you will analyze each of these relationships in a model separately, but in MASEN, you can check all the relationships at the same time. So SEM basically is a framework for testing specific hypotheses and you can constrain parameters or leave out a direct path and see where the model fits the, better the data. So that's uh, an of theory. So let's see how we can use the MetaSEM package to estimate a mass and model. In this presentation, I will go uh, or use uh, uh, the paper or the information from Sherry and Theo, 2019. Uh, the author have uh, uh, shared with me the code and I have done some uh, slightly modification and I also will actually post an OSU code where you can access the, the slides of this presentation and in their, their code. So in this paper, uh, the authors wanted to evaluate the technology acceptance model. In this model, I was to, tell, I was to explain the teacher's intentions to use technology. So as you can see here, we have four variables. Intentions to use technology, attitudes toward technology, perceived ease of use, and perceived usefulness. And in the paper, the authors argue that uh, this model has been, uh, let's say there are two variants of this model. And the differences between the model is that some of the authors actually uh, found a direct effect of perceived usefulness on intentions to use technology. And in others, or other authors didn't find that. So the research questions in this particular uh, paper was to what extent does the time represents the teacher data, for example? And to what extent does a direct effect exist? So in this, uh, in this example, uh, the authors collected information from 50 studies and four different variables, the variables I already presented, that sum up to a total of 300 correlations or, or 50 correlation matrices. So let's see how this looks in R. So to use MASIN, you need the correlations between the variables you want to test. And it's important to note that, of course, not all the studies might report the same number of correlations. Some studies might report the information, the correlation among all these four variables in the model, and some studies might report less information. The nice thing about MASEM is that all these studies can be used uh, in the meta-analysis because it will use an FELL estimator to kind of compute uh, the missing data uh, in your analysis. So in this uh, model, in the technology acceptance model, we got actually four variables. Uh, so there are six different possible um, correlation coefficients that you will need to code from the uh, primary data. An important thing with MASEM is that when you code your information, you don't mess up uh, with the column. Uh, so you need to check for that because we will use, or you will need to use this uh, for like, feeding your, your MASEM model. So there are two things that you need basically to uh, fit a mass model. First thing is a list of correlation covariance matrices. And the second tier, it's a vector of sample size. The first thing before actually fitting your mass model is to check for the positive definitiveness of the single study matrices. And there are different reasons that can lead to not positive correlation matrices, such as correlation coefficients close to zero, small negative correlations next to positive correlations or a mismatch between the reported correlated matrices and the model parameters in the primary study. So the MetaSIM package has this is a dot pd function and the output of this analysis will be true, false or na. If the output is true, it means that the matrix is positive definitive and you can use this uh, for your uh, study or for your meta-analysis. If the output is false, then the matrix is not positive definitive, and then you will need to exclude actually uh, this correlation matrix from the, from the study. Another thing you can do is that you can, of course, check uh, how many studies you have per correlation and the sample sizes per correlation. So as you can see here in this particular study, there were 50 studies per correlation and actually 14,918 observations. Uh, that's, a, I think, a nice uh, sample size. After you read your data and check for the positive definitives of the correlation matrices, then you can continue to the first stage of the estimation of a massive model. 
And here, please note that there are also one stage mass and models. Uh, however, here I'm talking about this two stage because so far is the most common methodology used. Uh, so the goal in the first stage of a two stage mass and model is to pull the correlation matrices from the different studies to create an average correlation matrix. So this is a multivariate analysis of correlation coefficients. And to do this, you can use this uh, TSSM1 function. And in the function, you will need to provide uh, the list of the, with the correlation matrices and the vector of sample sizes. And you also need to specify where you want to estimate a fixed effect models or a random effect models. Finally, you will also need to specify the diagonal matrix uh, that you will be using for the random effects. Uh, in this example, and in most of the uses of muscle models, you need to assume that there are no covariances among the random effects, because usually it's not feasible to estimate the random effects given an insufficient number of studies. As an output of this uh, analysis of this first stage, you will get an estimate of the bullet correlations and the heterogeneities, uh, and a measure of course the confidence intervals and the standard errors. We can also obtain a measure of the E square or of heterogeneity between studies in these correlation coefficients. And a common assumption here is that an E square of 25, 50, and 75 roughly will be considered low, medium, and high. Uh, of course, that will change uh, from field to field. But in this particular example, we actually observe that there is a considerable heterogeneity in the correlations. So it might be actually useful to perform some moderator analysis to try to explain this variance. We can also extract the average correlation matrix from the stage one, uh, just to have a better overview uh, but you don't really need to do this for the estimation of the mass and model. However, it's a very nice uh, way to display or to summarize the information. So after you obtain your polyt correlation matrix, we can start with the stage two, uh, which will be the estimation or the proper fitting of your mass and model. And in stage two, we will use the average correlation matrix extracted from stage one to fit our SEN model. So first, you need to specify the SEN model using the Lavan syntax or the RAM syntax. Uh, in Lavan syntax, your predictor variable will be on the left and your predictors are on the right. Single tilde means a regression and a double tilde means a covariance or a correlation. It's very important when you are specifying your uh, SEN model in the Lavan syntax that you actually fit uh, the variance of the exogenous variables to one, otherwise the model will not be able to compute. And as I said before, uh, MetaSEM works with the RAM syntax because it works using the OpenMX software. Um, so if you are familiar with that syntax, that's something that you can directly specify. If not, then as I said, you can use this Lavan syntax and then use this Lavan to RAM uh, function to uh, transform uh, the, the, to your SEM model yeah, or your LA, Lavan syntax to this uh, RAM syntax. So that's very nice. So after you got your SEN model, then you can pass to the second stage in the estimation of your mass and model. And in this stage, your goal is to fit your SEN model in your average correlation matrix that you estimated on stage one. And you can do this using this TSSM2 function. So your, um, your input will be the object that you created from the first stage and the RAM parameterization of your SEN model. You can also define the type of confidence intervals that you want. And you need also to specify again where you have diagonal constraints on your random effects. As a result, as you can see, you will have obtained the parameter estimates of your SEN model and the 95% confidence intervals. You can also obtain like a measure of the residual variance and then have a, a, a test or like a kind of a feeling of how well our model is performing. So for example, here we see that the residual variance of intentions to use technology, that's let's say the main uh, outcome or variable of interest is 63%. So that means that our model roughly explains 37% uh, of the variance in this variable. As part of the output, uh, you can also obtain some fit measures for your SEN model. And of course this field is quite controversial and there are not universally accepted roles. 
But you can see here that you got like a chi square, so that you can test uh, the fitting of your model, and you got also measures of uh, the root mean square error of approximation and the standardized root mean square residual, and also some uh, comparative fit indices. In MetaSAM, you can also represent the model using the meta to sum plot function. Uh, so here, basically, what you can do is to uh, visualize these parameters uh, in the model, in the proposed model that uh, I introduced at the beginning of the presentation. So that's also a nice way of like kind of having a, a general overview of how you're performing, how your model is performing. Finally, and I think that's the, uh, the most important thing. And here again, I will repeat that uh, this technique is not an exploratory technique, it's a confirmatory technique and your models will be needed to be based on the theory is that you can compare different models. So if you remember at the beginning, the authors were interested in evaluating when there is a direct or not, or uh, an indirect effect of this intentions, uh, perceived usefulness on the intentions to use technology. So you can use this average correlation matrix that you estimated on stage one for uh, uh, feeding another SCN model. And then you can perform a chi-square uh, difference test to compare the performance of the two models. So for example, here we see that uh, actually uh, when we fit or when we estimate the direct path, then the fit of the model is better than when we don't estimate uh, this direct path. Some things to be aware when you are uh, fitting your uh, massing model is first to check where your database is organized properly because uh, sometimes you've got characters in the data set instead of numbers and that would represent a problem. Or maybe you have uh, some parts of the correlations that are not coded. You also need to make sure, as I said before, to uh, uh, that you code your information in the run column because otherwise if you got a mix of correlation indices in the run column, that's something that will not be flat in the, in the estimation of the massive model. Another thing that you can check is where maybe you can estimate the phase one or the stage one uh, and your massing model, because if you can do that, maybe it's a problem related with the Lavan syntax. Uh, so that's also something that you will need to be aware. Uh, and problems in the Lavan syntax will be related, for example, with things that such as that you didn't specify of the parameters, or maybe you got a typo in your variable names or that you didn't fix uh, the variance of your exogenous variable to one. Sometimes you also get convergence errors. So here the common approach is just to rerun the model because maybe it just needs a couple more of iterations uh, and it usually will converge, but I mean, that will change uh, from case to case. So in sum, with MASM, you can test and compare models representing substantive theory and examine heterogeneity in model parameters. And of course, there are still different challenges that need to be addressed, such as it doesn't support a multi-level structure of the primary and secondary data. So for example, with MASM models, you cannot uh, have more than one correlation per sample, uh, correlation matrix per sample, or you cannot incorporate uh, hierarchical structures, such as, for example, when you have students nested in classrooms. Another thing to be aware is that the fit of the SEN model on the average correlation matrix doesn't translate on the proper fit on each of the studies that you use on your stage number one. Um, so that could also be actually a source of bias when you are working with these models. And that is everything. If you have any questions, comments, uh, I like uh, messages, so feel free to contact me. And thank you for your attention.